Итак, друзья, я... Well, folks, I spent the day here on Lake Baikal at minus four degrees Fahrenheit, and I thought I could handle more. And so I'm about to dive into Lake Baikal. It's covered by ice. They make special holes like this in the ice. They cut them with a chainsaw so you can dive in. They tell me it's not cold in there, that it might even be kind of warm. Oh well, so I'm off to change into the suit. Well, folks, I'm about to dive into the ice-covered lake Baikal. Today, I will show you how people live by one of the world's most breathtakingly beautiful lakes, challenged by harsh Siberian winter climate. The lowest temperature in this area can reach minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The ice crust on the lake is five feet thick, but sometimes even thick ice can crack. The most popular kind of vehicle to travel on ice is a hovercraft, like this one. It's got one great advantage, and it's that it allows you to glide over cracks or spots with open water as long as they're not too big, if they, God forbid, happen to be in your way. The number of visitors this year is beating all records. The demand is so high, it's next to impossible to get down here. And here they are, the famous air bubbles in the ice on Lake Baikal. And they are stunning. Tourists travel miles and miles over the ice covering the lake and pay loads of money for a ride on a hovercraft to have pictures taken with them. I'll show you things on and around Lake Baikal that tourists don't get to see. Everything that stays hidden behind all those beautiful snapshots of nature. All the residents here have a curious feature a small rectangular opening in the fence, like a window in a kiosk of sorts. Do you have any idea what it is? People living right next to the world's largest freshwater lake have no water supply pipeline. The only guy who used to deliver water to people has no driving license and that's it. Water delivery stopped and there are no other options. While humanity is making active use of nanotechnology, gene engineering and developing hypersonic vehicles, there are villages by Lake Baikal where they have no water supply. No communication lines, nothing whatsoever at all. I am deeply shocked that there are places like this in Russia even today. I mean, what the heck? How is it possible? I have no words, really. But people here seem to be sort of plugged into this Lake Baikal's special energy source, no less. Look at this old lady, for example. Her second name is Morkododva. It means seafarer. She is more than 80 years old, and she cuts wood, she drives, she makes holes in thick ice, and keeps cows, all on her own. And if I need to cross the sea, I skate. No biggie. The population of villages around Lake Baikal is shrinking. Some have one or two people left, but they are true diamonds in the rough. This is Ledov, and today I am reporting from Lake Baikal. I'll be honest, it's my first time here, but it's freaking awesome. And the energy here is totally incredible and simply through the roof. Lake Baikal has become a very popular tourist destination recently, but few people know that there are a number of very interesting remote villages around the lake. Sometimes you can only get there in winter, crossing the ice. We will go there to find out how people live in places where going shopping means skating across a lake for a few miles where you have to look out for cracks.
This is Leodov reporting on how people live on Lake Baikal. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet? The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right, go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. When underwater, it's key to take slow and deep breaths. The temperature outside is minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Water temperature is about 35 to 37 degrees Fahrenheit. How deep are we diving? Well, we'll stay right under the ice, but overall, right under the ice? Yes. The diving gear is pretty standard. The only way to get warmer is to put on some fleece thermal underwear first. I've got none of my own, so they'll give me a used set. One sleeve is wet, but they tell me I'll be warm soon enough. You'll have a double-layered mask. They also warn me that water is to get inside the suit I'm wearing, and it's important not to panic. Maybe it's not too late to say no? I haven't done any diving even in normal temperature, let alone ice-cold water. The worst that can happen to you in cold water is you can get a cramped foot or leg. Six feet underwater, you start feeling terrible pain in your ears, so you have to equalize the pressure. You pinch your nose and breathe, like a plane during the takeoff. But, you know, pinching my nose while I'm wearing these huge gloves and a plastic mask is going to be quite the challenge underwater. The key rule I must stick to is that I am a suitcase. In other words, oh, this one's wet too. A suitcase is just a heavy, useless thing. That is, I'm like a useless suitcase, meaning I cannot do anything except sink. I am not to try and move my arms and legs about like when I'm swimming. That's a no-go. I must remain motionless like a sinking suitcase. They attach weights to me. I've been putting on weight all year, and it turns out it's not enough. Well, to be honest, I kind of feel pretty nervous about this, because I never expected this, you know. When I looked at this hole in the ice, I thought, okay, we'll go in, cool, and I'll just say hello underwater. But now they say we're going to reach some boys, so we'll actually go somewhere under the ice. Don't take me wrong, I am not trying to make myself a hero, I'm just trying to share my emotions. Just the idea that you're not simply going to dive into ice cold water, but you'll actually swim under the ice, that you have absolutely no way of breaking through, it makes you feel pretty shitty. And now I want to pee. No urination in the suit. To see Lake Baikal's ice from below is a long time dream of mine. You see, the thing is that Lake Baikal is no ordinary lake like any other you might think of. It was created by the rift between two tectonic plates, the larger Eurasian plate and the smaller Amur plate. The rift is still growing, with the Amur plate slowly going down, making Lake Baikal a little wider every year. The rift zone is also prone to earthquakes, which is why they build no tall buildings in the nearest city of Ulanude, and its downtown area has only two-story buildings. The rift explains why Lake Baikal is the deepest lake in the world. It could have two Burj Khalifa skyscrapers on top of each other standing on its bottom, or five Eiffel Towers, or 17 Big Bends. One minute to go. You know what? I don't feel cold. I'm even warmer than in my winter jacket. It's pretty amazing. Now I put on swim fins, although I'm not allowed to really use them underwater. The risk is that I might get the toe cord wrapped around me or start panicking, which is even worse. But my head is cold because it's wet. Get on the edge. Wait, wait, now look, this is your left hand, I will sometimes take it and lift it. For the very first few seconds, it all felt pretty unsettling. 
It wasn't properly cold, but I could feel the ice-cold water get inside the suit through its tiny pores. I began thrashing about in the water like crazy. What's up? My head is freezing! You'll get used to it soon, no worries. My head is freezing like hell and the ice is so thick here, it's at least one foot thick. When I finally get it down, it starts feeling like I'm on a different planet. About five minutes in, I stop panicking and experience a zen-like state like never before. I see this stunning beauty, this incredibly powerful work of nature, the lake, the ice, the winter, and the lake's bottom is green, like a springtime meadow, with some cute critters on it that look like bugs. The most outstanding thing about all this is the water. It's truly crystal clear, like nowhere else, totally unique. What do you think Lake Baikal's water could cost if our country were to start selling fresh water instead of oil? Well, roughly. Professor Timishkin at the Limnological Institute with the Russian Academy of Sciences made some calculations in US dollars. If one liter of Lake Baikal water were to cost one dollar, you'd have to put a price tag on 23,000 cubic kilometers of water. And that gives us 23,000 trillions of US dollars. That's roughly 4,000 budgets of the USA, 5,000 budgets of China, or 6,000 budgets of Germany. For a long time, people considered Baikal a sea, because this lake is truly colossal. Only think of this, it contains 20% of the world's total supply of fresh water. This lake alone accounts for 90% of Russia's total freshwater reserves. If hypothetically Lake Baikal were to dry up suddenly, it would take all of the world's known rivers to fill it up again. At some point, I started to spin in water and got the tow cord wrapped around me. I even tried knocking on ice, but... Before I continue this story, I want to tell you how you can get to Lake Baikal. Truth be told, the price tag on a trip that will take you to see the world's largest reservoir of the most expensive fresh water will blow your mind, as much as the lake itself. In winter season, hotels start charging three to four times the usual price, ranging from $150 a night to $200 per night. A return flight from Moscow will cost as much as a round trip to Italy, about $500 per person. Christ on a stick, I'll be damned if I didn't just fall through that gap. I say, that's a shocker. I guess I was too relaxed and didn't expect anything like that. I mean, absolutely I didn't. A gap between the plane and the ramp. Welcome to Irkutsk, I guess. And it's not too cold, by the way, but very moist. You know, you feel that the air is both cold and moist, and it's the time just before the dawn. But I don't feel too cold without a hat on. Not yet, at least. I was barely awake at the time. It was an overnight flight that lasted five and a half hours, and the plane was full. I feel like I'm still half asleep, or more. 
I nearly zoned out just now on the plane after I put my sock on. It took me half an hour to remember to put the other one on. I wonder if this happens to any of you. It happens to me all the time, that's <laughs> typical me. The temperature outside is minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit. People are telling me that it's in fact warm as it is. You know, every time I go somewhere north, people tell me, oh, you're lucky, it's pretty warm now. That's what they're saying to me now too, that the seasons are changing slowly this year and the ice on Lake Baikal is taking longer to form and that everyone here is happy now that it's finally getting colder. I say it's freaking cold and I'm not wearing any thermal underwear. I need to put some on right now. It was so cold, I opened my suitcase to look for my thermals right in the parking lot. There's another thing that's very unusual. Once you exit the Irkutsk airport, you actually find yourself in the city. There are streets around you with cars and buses and houses. Like, it's a railway station rather than an airport. I mean, it's very unusual. I haven't seen anything like this before. And they have plenty of taxi cabs parked right here. See these with orange roof lamps? They remind me of how things were at the airports in Moscow some 15 years ago. Back then, it was the same in Moscow. And now I'm in real Russia. Anywhere outside of Moscow is real Russia, and it often feels like you arrive in another country. Especially when it's so freaking cold. The first guy I see upon arrival is this extravagant man in a classic Russian fur hat and fur coat. It looks like it's made out of a polar bear. Something tells me it's a great sign as I embark on my mission. <laughs> and my mission is to travel from Irkutsk to the most remote villages around Lake Baikal. Let's take a look at the map. There are places where tourists mostly go. They include Listivyanka, Baikalsk, Kurzye, and Olkan Island, Gremyachinsk, Turka, and a handful of other places in Buryatia. But the truth is that there are hundreds of villages located around Lake Baikal and their population ranges from 5,000 people per village to 100, or 50, or 15, or even two people per village. And traveling to some of these villages is a problem, since there is no road. You can travel on ice across the lake, but it has some risks. Are you ever scared to drive on ice? I am, every single time. For real? You have to be scared. Then you'll be fine, because you'll think clearly. Being here is an unbelievable experience. I am all alone, somewhere in the middle of Lake Baikal, surrounded by complete silence that is only sometimes broken by a sound like this that makes your heart sink. It's so scary. It's scary like hell, take my word. I can't help but think about those movies where it starts with one thud, and then another one, and then there are millions of thuds, and you feel like you're about to fall through this enormously thick ice. People who live in cities don't really know what silence is. Try to hear this silence. Here, it surrounds you. And you realize that all the noises that we hear every single day, all day long, like cars driving by, people walking by, cleaners sweeping streets, all those city noises, when they're gone, 
you realize they've been distracting you from experiencing the key thing. This silence makes you realize you are just a speck of sand in this world, an infinitely tiny particle in the vast space, and it's right around you. You just have to hear it. Centuries ago, Giordano Bruno was burned alive at the stake for his cosmological views that said that the Earth wasn't the center of the solar system. They told him, you're a fool, and burned him. In the end, people discovered that the Sun is the center of the solar system, yet they kept on thinking that they are the true center of the universe. I think that when you finally understand you are not the center of the universe, but just a tiny part of it, that somehow, can navigate this complicated world by following the rules of the bigger order, it takes a lot of weight off your shoulders. There's too much snow on Lake Baikal now, that's true. So let's check how thick the ice is. Okay, how does it work? The hole is pretty deep already. And ice is very tough. Whoa, whoa, I can see water, I think. Yes, I can see water coming, here it is. I think my ice auger is stuck there. At this time of year, the ice should be at least three feet thick. Okay, let's see. It's gonna be lots of fun if I lose the auger to Lake Baikal. It's going in. Fuck! It's going all the way in, right into Lake Baikal. Whoa, whoa, look! That's how thick the ice is now, up to this mark. That's about 15 inches, barely more than one foot. Driving on ice is prohibited unless the ice is at least twice as thick. That's because many cargo trucks loaded with food and other stuff travel on ice. So, naturally, since each truck weighs dozens of tons, it'll sink if the ice is too thick. So we decided that traveling by car won't be the safest way to go. like what we are doing I would really appreciate if you support us on patreon on pioneer or on PayPal and we try to make even more great films from a new dangerous places for you thank you all the links are in the description please donate The most popular kind of vehicle to travel on ice is a hovercraft, like this one. It's got one great advantage, and it's that it allows you to glide over cracks or spots with open water, as long as they're not too big, if, God forbid, they happen to be in your way.
In essence, it's a boat on two air cushions. There are also bigger boats on three cushions, and this is the air propeller that generates thrust and enables the boat to move with relatively high speed. You can steer it left and right, of course, only compared to driving a car, the difference is that you have to begin any maneuver a lot earlier. In other words, to be able to drive a hovercraft around an obstacle, you have to start steering some 50 yards away from it. And there are no brakes at all here. No brakes, no brakes. You just stop giving it gas and it starts slowing down on its own. And you were saying that you have to start steering in advance if you see something? Yes, if I see an obstacle, I start steering well clear in advance so I won't have the hovercraft side exposed to the obstacle when I go around it. It's best if you always keep going front in a hovercraft. Because the side is vulnerable? Yes, big rocks can tear up the cushion. There are no speed readings on the dashboard because this vehicle has no wheels for measuring the speed. It can travel on water too, but very slowly and at great cost, since it consumes lots of fuel. In winter, and especially in spring, this vehicle is everyone's number one choice here. It's very expensive. A hovercraft like this costs about $100,000 to $130,000. And so to recoup the money invested, the locals who buy them give tours of the lake to visitors. Which is why these rides are expensive too. If you hire a hovercraft like this for a day, in order to go from Listivianca to Olcon Island, like all tourists do, it'll cost you around $1,000 per day in high season. Alexei, who is driving us around today, bought this hovercraft recently. It's a small one for six people. It's pre-owned. I paid uh, $40,000. $40,000 for a small one? And how much is a bigger one? Oh, that depends. Uh, the price range is really big. Well, a new one. A new big one costs around uh, $200,000. $200,000? A small, like mine, if it's new, costs at least $100,000 or more. And how long does it take to recoup the money? Uh, I don't know, uh, about a year, I guess. The popularity of Lake Baikal as a tourist destination is growing almost by the hour. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, the tourist flow came mostly from China. But ever since the pandemic, there's been a huge inflow of domestic visitors. Well, let's say that, on the average, without any kind of fancy things, staying here will cost about $150 or more per person per night. The average price. Speaking of meals, I'd say it costs about $350 per person per week. So roughly a week's stay will cost you $1,400 per person. Yes, you heard him right. A week's stay at Lake Baikal will cost you around $2 thousand dollars per person on top of the airfare and probably food so the entire trip will cost a family over seven thousand dollars that's like a trip to the maldives and yet the number of people who want to see lake baikal is only growing according to official statistics the absolute peak of tourist activity was registered in 2019 where almost two million people arrived to irkutsk to see lake baikal the following year the number of visitors dropped by more than half yet 2021 saw an increase in visitors when over a million tourists came again. All that said, Irkutsk region has only three five-star hotels, 33 three-star hotels, and a huge number of lodgings with no stars. Oh, I want a pee so badly I'm going to explode. The thing is that since they don't have a water supply system, they have no loose inside many of their hotels. That happens a lot here. Many affordable hotels here will have toilets outside. Well, I've got a special arrangement. It's not only outside, it's across the entire hotel's territory from my room. And I'm on my second run there tonight, and it's a friggin' nightmare, I'm telling you. First, you start by thinking, oh well, I'll hold it. And then you try to sleep for an hour, and then you realize you can't wait anymore, and you have to go. And then you put on your winter jacket over nothing but your undies and schlep over to the loo in the freezing cold night because you can't hold it anymore. And it feels like a special kind of torture. Well, after enjoying all of this, the vast stretches of Lake Baikal are smooth and shiny as a mirror, with its majestic islands and a mind-blowing variety of ice formations of breathtaking beauty.
After seeing the amazing sights Lake Baikal has to offer, we arrive in a typical Russian village. Olkan Island is one of the must-see places on the list of every visitor to Lake Baikal. The biggest settlement on the island is a village called Kusir, with a population of 1,350 people. Here you can see cows and dogs walking freely on the streets and lots of very old Soviet trucks covered with snow and ice. Pretty much every resident of Orkon Island is engaged in a tourism-related business this way or another. The catchier the sign, the more clients you can hope to attract. See this house? It seems like its owner painted it with every color money could buy in this area. Here's another place where they built a mock-up machine gun to attract customers. People use their creativity in every way they can. Here you can see a traditional sign on a local cafe, and here someone puts up an ad for tours that include hearty meals right on the fence. If you're here and wondering how you can get a taxi, all you have to do is look around and see some ads on the fence along the street. They post their ads on the fence easy and simple. Here's one taxi service, here's another one. Also, I noticed that every typical parking lot around Lake Baikal will have at least one hovercraft parked next to cars and vans. The most popular vehicle for driving on the roads here is the UAZ van. There is also an impressive number of vehicles that are no longer in use and are just rusting away like trailers and trucks. We've seen a guy ride a motorbike with a sidecar. I have also discovered a gas station behind the fence here. There are a total of two gas stations on the island. However, one didn't get their supply of gas on time and is now out of stock. The ice on the lake is not strong enough to start deliveries by riding on it. As a result, the only place that still has some gas in stock is the only functioning gas station. And it looks like this. Just a big wooden house surrounded by a fence. You go in and see a pump that probably dates back to Stalin's times. Hello! And here's one more pump, and people are using it to get gas. Gas prices are crazy. In February, they charged almost $1 per liter. Even though Irkutsk is one of the key producers of gas and oil in Russia, and yet they pay more for gas here than in many other regions of the country. And not only for gas, that's where it gets even more interesting. If you take a walk around Kuzhir, you're bound to notice that all of the residences here have a curious feature, a small rectangular opening in the fence like a window in a kiosk of sorts. And here, look, here's another window of the same kind, and it's open. Do you have any idea what it is? Imagine that here on an island right in the middle of Lake Baikal, this is their local water supply system. That's right, it's the 21st century and that's how people get their water. Lake Baikal's one and only island has no water pipelines that would deliver water to the households. People have no water taps at home. The local authorities are supposed to be running up a water delivery service using water trucks to cater to the population's needs. See this truck? I mean, it looks like the trucks that were used back in World War II. It's a water truck that's part of this local water supply deliver system. People don't have to pay much for this service, but as you can see, there's no snow under the truck, so it obviously has been parked here for a very long time. Do you know why? That's because there's no one to drive it. The only guy who drove it is Vasily, and he has no driving license. He delivered water for many years and the authorities kind of looked the other way and then they stopped and he couldn't drive anymore. I don't know if it's true. Some people say he never had a license while others say that he did but it expired and he never renewed it. But that's the situation. I was told that Vasily had no license so he wasn't allowed to work. License? Yeah, he's still in school. In a driving school? Yeah, until the end of the month. So, he'll get his license at the end of the month. No one wants this work. Why? Because it's hard work. I just think that this is completely crazy. And this parked, unused water truck is like a symbol of everything that's wrong in our country. Today, only private water suppliers deliver water to households. And this is what it looks like. They attach a water tank to an off-roader. See all the ice on the tank? 
As you see, this is no water truck. It's just a UAZ off-roader pulling a water tank. And it rides around the village making stops by the houses. And people open up their little windows I was asking you about. And the guy sticks in the water hose and opens up the water tap. It's hard work. And people in this village have a particular respect for the guy who brings them water. You know, all local businesses depend on me. You mean like... Like cafes. Cafes, right. And even hotels if they don't have a water well of their own. So they call you and ask you to come, right? Of course they do. There's a lot of work. Do you work on weekends too, or not? Do you get Saturdays and Sundays off? I work on weekends. Can't let anyone else drive my van because it's not easy to drive around here in the winter. Someone less experienced might end up having a traffic accident and no one wants that, okay? Mm -hmm. Last year and two years ago, I would get up at 3 and start working at 4. In the morning? Yep, I'll be home by 10pm. I worked like that for two months. That's just insane. There were a total of three trucks and we hardly were getting all the scheduled deliveries covered. We've got a tight schedule. Every minute counts. You've got to be very disciplined or it just won't work. There were guys who tried this job, but they lasted two or three days at most. They gave up because it's too hard. You've got to do everything by the minute, to know your schedule by heart. I see. Okay, thanks for all your hard work. I hope people appreciate it. And all the best to you. 220 liters of water costs one dollar. That's one barrel. It doesn't seem expensive, but every household usually buys three or four barrels at a time to have enough water for at least a few days. The territory of Olkhan is a state-protected national park, which means you're not allowed most anything here, like cut grass, walk on grass, or use water from the lake. That's right, no one is allowed here to get even a bucket of water from the lake for their needs. But people have to have water to live. I've heard people call the situation with all the local bans a legal anomaly. It's so absurd. Our next stop is a village called Kali. I have to walk there for the last few miles. Here, in a village, in houses like this one, you get no water tap. So, what do people do? Well, one way is to drill a water well. But say, if you're an old lady, you can't just drill a water well. That's what you do. Watch me. Here's what you do. Ouch! Oh, right, I don't love this. It's a small ice hole for people to get some water right from Lake Baikal. Lyubov Mokodova is the only resident of Kali. It's really hard to get water, you see how it is? It's windy and all. Today it fell into the water. No way, right into the water? I sure did, right here. I slipped and fell. I had to give water to the calves. Oh, let go, I'm okay. The truth is, I'll trip and fall sooner than this lady. I got out as wet as a fish. Here, look, that's where I fell. And I fell flat like this. Lyubov Morkadova is over 80 years old. She does pretty much everything, all on her own. So, you cut wood too? No. Well, who's gonna chop some wood for me, huh? Who will? No one will, right? You, be careful. Don't fall. I don't need you breaking no bones. No wood, no fire. No fire, and you're dead. Within five hours, with nothing but snow around. <laughs> That's new. I've never missed before. It's probably the jitters. 
Morkadova keeps two cars, an old UAZ off-roader and a Toyota. Believe it or not, she still drives and can give you a run for your money. I drove my boyfriend, that's right, when he got sick. Only to Sarma or Kerma, because my driving license expired in March 2019. You see, I need to go to Yelensi, get all the tests done, this and that. And how am I going to do all that to get a new license? I look at her and I can just see that here's a lady that has lived life to the fullest. She's got one hell of a fire in her. She was born in 1941, soon after the war started. Before you can carry some water home, you got to get access to water. It's an ice chisel. It's very heavy. Just try it yourself. It's just crazy how heavy it is. To do this, Lyubov Mokodova uses a very old tool designed for this purpose. Even though I asked her to let me help, she wanted to show me how she's doing it herself. She's 80, but look at how much energy she's got. She can surely teach me a thing or two. No, you can't remove the ice with a chisel. I know, I just wanted to get it onto this spoon you're holding. It's some sort of an ice spoon. Not a spoon, really. A sort of skimmer of sorts, you see? And it serves to, you know, first you make a hole in the ice and clear it of large chunks of ice, and then you use this thing to fish out all the smaller bits of ice. And it's really handy, by the way. I mean, well, certainly it would be a lot easier to have a tap and get water by simply opening it, but this is what it is. And now we've got access to water in Lake Baikal. Or what? And one can drink it just like that, with no filters. I'm going to try drinking it right from this hole. Mm. I feel like I'm getting in touch with all this primeval might of Lake Baikal. I don't know, it's my feeling. I find Lake Baikal completely mind-blowing. I just love it. I really feel in touch with its energy. And it's tremendous. It blows my mind. Mm, by the way, the water tastes almost warm because the air temperature is minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very unusual. My advice to everyone is to come to Lake Baikal and take a sip of water right from the lake. It's such a special experience. It makes you realize you're in a very special place. That makes you feel like this life finally makes some sense. I'm telling you, the water feels warm for real. I'm not pretending in any way now. My face is probably all red now and will start freezing off soon, but it's okay. Lyubov Mokodova brings home two buckets of water every day, each of them half full. That's enough to cook food for herself and her three dogs. Do you cook yourself too? No, I asked my uncle. You're so funny. Who would do it for me here? There's no one around. She also keeps cows, about a dozen of them. She can't carry enough water to give to them, so she lets them walk to a river that never freezes, where they can drink. To keep an eye on them, she skates along right on Lake Baikal. When you get to see something like this, it is really hard to believe it's happening for real and not in a movie.
Right now, we're on our way to some places off the beaten track. We're still on Lake Baikal, but to get there, we have to travel through some real wilderness. You can see the forest, the lake, the empty shores. There are no tourists here, not a single person. And that's where real life begins for all those people who live in villages on Lake Baikal. The views are breathtaking. It's like a winter fairyland. And look at these trees. People call them walking trees here. This is how they look. Their roots get exposed because strong winds blow away a lot of sand and soil that were covering them. These trees really look like they have tentacles and can any second just walk away on them. Finally, we begin seeing some houses, although some of them seem to have holes in their roofs, while others have no roof at all. This village is called Peschanka. This part of the village has only two residents. So what have you got here? Nothing. Absolutely nothing at all? Absolutely nothing. A shop? No shops, no electricity, no internet, nothing. We've got nothing water. here. Water? I, I mean, tap water? Of course not. Using water from the lake is forbidden. No electricity at all? Not at all. So you've got your own. So it's like the 19th century? Yes. In Soviet times, this place was full of people. They had a fish processing plant, a medical station. Just think of it, they had a school for all the children. And now, only two people live here. This used to be a school in the village of Pizjanka. So you can imagine that even though this village might have always been small, there were enough people with children to fill this school. As you can also see, even though the school wasn't big, it had several classrooms. Let's see what it looks like inside. As far as I can see, this is one classroom where lots of kids could fit in. And if we go further, this here was probably a teacher's office or something like that. If we walk a bit further, here's another big classroom. So this school had at least two classrooms. Oh wait, this here was probably a lunch area, you see this opening? They most probably served food through it, but all the same, wasn't it great that a small village that had just about 20 households was so well taken care of? It was provided with all the necessary basic infrastructure and a school to make people comfortable here, to encourage them to stay rather than pack up and move to a city. And that's how it looks today. The few local residents, no wait, the only two local residents, are Nahazda Burkina and her husband. They really care for each other a lot. Nahazda was very much looking forward to our arrival, but she said that if we come after 3pm, she won't be able to talk to us because her husband would come soon from the garage and she'll need to have the dinner ready for him. They cook food on a very old wood stove. Well, together we get less than $400. So about... $200 per person, even less? Yep, that's about it. So, what can you buy with this money? What can we buy? Well, gas. Well, perhaps a little more gas. If you feel like watching a TV or just fancy having the lights on after sundown, you need to ride some 15 miles to a village that sells gas. The Bulkans use electricity for two hours every day, in the evening. Nehezda washes the dishes in this plastic green bowl. The cell phone receives signal in only one place, on a bedside stand by the window, which is the reason it's always there, like a landline phone. But the most intriguing subject is the fridge. They don't have a power line to plug it into, and the closest place with shops is 15 miles away. We drive there every week to shop for food in Kazir, and then we drive to a village that's closer to us and that has got power lines. We leave our food there and then drive three miles there and three miles back every time we need some. Wait, you leave it where? In a village nearby. Why? What for? It's the closest village that's got electricity. Oh, I see. And our fridge is there. It's there? But where? At a friend's place? Yes, at a friend of ours. 
that's just crazy. The Bulkins keep cows and sheep, and that means they've got lots of work to do all day round, and no breaks. They do it by choice. A few years ago, they decided to move from a city to the countryside, bought an old house, and made some improvements. This person with the grace of a sinking brick in Lake Baikal is me. I'm giving an OK sign to the diver who is accompanying me to let him know I'm fine. Steepled hands would be a sign that I'm screwed. I'm shooting myself without seeing clearly the camera and trying to tell you about all those wonderful things I see on the bottom of the lake. I feel like I'm Lake Baikal's own Jacques-Yves Cousteau. Just look at this. Lake Baikal's unique environment is home to the world's largest population of endemic species. Endemic refers to plants and animals that live only here and nowhere else. It's curious enough that hotels around Lake Baikal seem to have a rule of their own forbidding patrons to eat fish in the rooms. Can you guess why? I've been told that it's because multiple tourists from a neighboring country used to throw too many fish bones right on the carpet floor, and they are a pain to get out of it. I'm making sure that all the fish bones stay right here on the table and that the local carpets are completely safe. And I'm about to try Lake Baikal's most famous fish treat, the Baikal Cisco. That's forbidden to catch, in fact. The Baikal Cisco is Lake Baikal's number one delicacy. It is also an endemic species. I already mentioned this. It means that this fish live only here and nowhere else. Since 2017, there has been a complete ban on catching the Baikal Cisco. I think this fish is the most protected fish in the world. It's just crazy. So, of course, I have to try it if I can. Well, first of all, it smells absolutely amazing. I love smoked fish in general, but the smell of smoked Baikal Cisco is something out of this world entirely. It smells so good. It's almost like you can see all those wood fires with all the fish over it, dripping its fat, smoking to perfection. I'm sure you're wondering how comes I'm about to eat a fish that's actually for to catch. All you have to do is go to the central market and find the fish aisle. Roll on guys, perfect fish for you here. Look, hey, you with the camera, come here. Now you've got to buy it. I opened it for you and it got cold. It got cold, are you buying? <laughs> so from a legal point of view, one is allowed to catch the Baikal Cisco, but only in the winter time and only for personal use. Each and every merchant on the market has his own story, explaining how the Baikal Cisco ended up being their merchandise rather than still swimming in the lake. <laughs> the fish jumps out trying to kill itself. So all these fish here simply jumped out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no kidding. Are you buying guys or you just stop for a chimwag? <laughs> Again, legally, they're not allowed to sell the Baikal Cisco, even if the fish really were to jump out of the lake and into their hands. This ban on catching the Cisco dealt such a heavy blow on the local economy that representatives of a number of indigenous people wrote a collective letter to the head of Buryata, explaining that this ban threatens their people with absolute impoverishment. Life is hard here. Everything is expensive. A loaf of bread costs 70 cents. It will be a dollar soon. Oh, stop complaining. Life is okay as it is. No, I mean it. Oh, so there are fishing quotas here? Exactly. Like, when they process tons of it. So we are now only allowed to catch very little. But we have to make the ends meet somehow. We sell fish to be able to buy bread and milk, you know? And it's important. Of course it is. It's our only way to make money here. There are no other jobs here. And there are no other jobs? Where? There's nothing here. No jobs. One other option is to give rides on the lake to tourists. That works too. Only in the city, but it's far. Он живой, он дышит, он дышит. 
It's alive, it's breathing. You know, it's sometimes very angry, but sometimes it's very calm and clear. Its water is crystal clear. It's like a true gem, like an emerald, really. There are no words to describe it. Often, when I walk along the lake, I sing songs about it, about all of this beauty. The nature here is so beautiful. All these shores, all the islands, all this is life. And it actually gives you strength. You know, the time I spent on Lake Baikal helped me realize that it is such a powerful place. Not just because it's the world's largest freshwater lake, but because of all the strong people that live here. Lake Baikal is the place of people with a truly strong spirit, who seem to understand things that we, the people in more central areas like Moscow, somehow either are failing or not willing to grasp.